Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's have the young people go out for the kingdom kids. And uh, boy, we have had a tremendous week. Our teenagers went to Nashville, the only one I know of, and uh, they worked hard. 92 plus degrees in the uh, high humidity, and they did everything, and they didn't quit. It was, it was, it was beautiful. It really was. Today in the assembly, we've got some friends to the Swartz and Troopers family uh, ministry. Uh, am I safe saying Joliet area? Oh, let's do that one. Yeah. America. Let's say Illinois ministry, disciples doing life for Jesus. And uh, Sheila is part of that, and Sheila is known as Mama Bear. You didn't think I knew that, did you? Okay, so uh, thank you for being here today. And I want to thank the teenagers for, uh, in the Bible study hour this morning, they, they talked about their trip and, and blessed us and God has blessed us with fabulous uh, disciples in these, in these teenagers, and I'm grateful for them. All right, so Jesus is the light of the world. Please turn in your scriptures to John's Gospel, chapter 1. Jesus is the true light of the world. Now, a buddy of mine, he's deceased now. His name was Mark Billiter, but we never called him uh, Mark Billiter. We called him Shindig. He was from the mountains of uh, Virginia, the Grundy, Virginia, to be exact. And he told me one time, he said that the mountains are so steep and high there that the sun doesn't come up till 10 and it goes down at 2. And that was uh, always hilarious to me. But it turns out that it's not so much of a stretch. It turns out that it's not much of an exaggeration. Let me share how. There's an article written by Alan Taylor in the Atlantic.com, and he talked about uh, in Norway and in Italy, there are towns that the mountains are so tall and steep that they do not get the sunshine in, 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 on those streets for six months out of the year. So what they've done in those villages is they've erected on the mountaintops gigantic mirrors and these, they, they track the sun, and they cast a 6,500 square foot uh, beam, if you would, a beam down onto the town so they can have light. I, oh, that's a, they're heliostats is what they're called, heliostats. And it's a phenomenal concept to me. Also on BBC.com, Linda Geddes. Linda Geddes had written about the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine. It was a treatise or a, a book uh, on health and disease. They estimate that this book was probably written 300 years before Christ was born of Mary. And so this is an old book, but listen, it describes how the seasons uh, affect the emotions of people. And, and, and it suggests in that book that during the winter, one should uh, go to bed early and get up when the sun comes up because we know that the value of light, the value of light is so important. And so Linda added in this uh, treatise, she said, uh, the French physician Philippe uh, Pinel, uh, in, in his little booklet published in 1806, he said, he talked about mental deterioration in some of his psychiatric patients when cold weather of December and January came in in France. There was a big difference in people that suffered with uh, mental illness. Even healthy people who have no seasonal problems seem to experience a low amplitude change over the year. And their attitude and their mood gets better in the spring and summer. We crave light, don't we? We crave light. That's amazing to me, and it's interesting to say the least about the power of light. Ephesians 5, 8. Now, we're going to be in John 1, but I just want to bring in and introduce Ephesians 5, 8, describing what Paul wrote. He said, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord Jesus. Then he says this, walk as children of light. 
Walk as children of light. Being a Christian, following the teachings of Jesus, makes a difference in our life. Makes a difference in us. Attitude uh, brings altitude in our lives. While you, you love being a Christian, you love your relationship with Jesus, you love our church family, you love the intimacy that we have with the Father, you love how the Holy Spirit walks with us and guides us yeah, and convicts us of sin or wrongdoing when that applies. But uh, you love your family, you love your work, you love your friends, you love life, and it was Jesus that brought this difference. Praise his name. Now, our text, we're, we're in John 1, and even though we're going through 18 today, uh, quickly, uh, I want to read verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5. So read along uh, with me. Now, I'm in the New American Standard Bible, so don't read out loud, okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so let's shine some light this morning on, on our Savior and, and just glean some of the things that we love about him. Number one, we need to recognize the true light is he. And I just read four and five, in him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. And like those mirrors that they use in Norway and Italy to shine light down into the valley, or reflect, I think is a better word. They reflect that light down into their valleys, into the streets. And you know, we live in America and we're very materialistic. We're, we're very anything and everything, to be honest with you. And so um, we need to recognize that the true light is Jesus and, and there's a lot of things that we're going to try in this world to, to try to get light out of it. And it's just going to fail. It's just going to fail. It's going to disappoint. And yet sometimes we're not smart enough to come out of it, right? We stay in that. But, uh, you know, some people think that sports is, is they, they live and breathe sports. To them, that has more light than Jesus. And other people um, will sit long periods of time in a bar in the dark and just drink until somebody needs to take them home. And then other times, uh, Charles Darwin and, and Stephen Hawking, uh, they love to study our God's creation, but they wouldn't ever acknowledge that it's God's creation. Other people think that, that has, science has more light than the Holy Scriptures. And others feel that world religions have light. And, and they would name Islam or they would name Hare Krishna or the Hindi. I, I can only name Vashti, one of their gods. I went to India in 2013 and they told me that they have uh, 330 million gods. Everything's a god to them. We saw cows laying down in the streets as if they were dogs in America. It's, it's truly amazing that people think other things have more light than our Jesus. And uh, others have the humanist standpoint. There is nothing else in this life. It is only through the, the fun things, the material things that we enjoy here. But it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You are different. You serve Jesus. You know that he is the light, and he lights up our life. Verses 6 and 8 of this text, 6 and 8, there came a man from God whose name was John, verse 8. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Many thought that John the Baptist was the light, and he admitted freely, I am not, I am not he that is coming to save you. And I'm glad that he was so bold, and we ought to be as bold to say, it's not me. It's the Lord Jesus. Verses 9 through 11. Let's read that. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Enlightens every man. Fills the void. And verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own. That is, he came to his own universe. He came to his own world. And, to, and those who were his own, his own people, the Jewish nation... They did not receive him. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See, you and I did not earn that right. There, there's nothing you and I can do to earn the right to be a child of God. He gave that right to us. That's why this text is not only so powerful, but it's so beautiful. So when John the Baptist spoke, there was a lot of light in his ministry. Uh, he revealed sin. The truths that he taught from God penetrated the darkness of his world, and people flocked out, out of all over that region to the Jordan River to hear his messages, to gain hope, and to be baptized by him. But John didn't produce that light. John just reflected the light that he received from God. In our universe, the moon reflects our sun. Back November 2016, we experienced a super moon. Some of you cared enough to go out there and see that rascal. The super moon, 2016. Now, before that, it had not come about for 68 years. Now, the next one is even sooner, and some of you will be able to see it. And that super moon is coming, they say, 2034, in another 10 years. You've got time to put it on your calendar. I'm not interested if I'm not here. I'm not interested in seeing that super moon because if I'm not here, I'm with the sun. That's our joy. But I'm not against anybody looking outside their house or going out in the country where it's darker and seeing a super moon and how large it looks. But see, that's an illustration to remind us that we are light reflectors. We reflect the light that Jesus gives us, and we do not produce that light. You know, this, this, this was revealed to us at our vacation Bible school. Man, we had a party. We had a great time with those kids, but we had a great time with each other. And it was, it was a blast. It really was. And so it's rewarding. Serving Jesus not only pays, but it's rewarding in our lives. It's a way to show the light of Christ, uh, but it also helps us. A program like Vacation Bible School helps us reflect the light that we have. I like that. And so in this message, I'm wanting each of us to focus why and how uh, we do life. And it's because we know Jesus. How do we do life? You know, the teens, uh, you that came to the Bible study hour at nine heard the teenagers talk about the missions trip to uh, Nashville. And uh, they worked so hard. Jaylee, Carter, Matthew, Jenna, Louie, Annie, Rosita, Yael. And uh, so grateful, uh, Katie Odell, as one of the leaders that went with me. Uh, just a solid lady for Jesus, and uh, I'm grateful. Okay, so we went down there to participate in a program called SLAM, uh, Students Living a Mission. And so on Tuesday, uh, we cleaned 15 apartments of elderly that could not clean their own apartment, and there's no one in their life that will do it. And so we saw some stuff, didn't we, young people? We cleaned some stuff, didn't we, young people? But we also sat down and talked with them and encouraged them and had prayer with them. And we, we were blessed. And so that, that was a Tuesday. And Wednesday, we distributed food to the apartments. And, uh, and that was a blessing. The, the people would just come out with, with large bags or, or with wagons and, and how many's in your family. And, and we would fix it up for how many's in their family as we were instructed. And, and they go back and, man, the smiles on the children's faces. It was, it was just dynamite. It was a blessing. And so that afternoon, uh, we packed 375 backpacks uh, full of school supplies. We packed uh, 900 kids' bags of food. Uh, one team packed it into the bag, and then we packed it in crates. Uh, to be shipped out, and, um, and, and their air conditioning in the warehouse broke before we got there. <laughs> you, you know when you sweat so bad that you got white rings of salt around you? I won't say anymore. But, but we had a blast doing this for Jesus and getting to know each other better, and that we were a team, and that we worked hard and uh, Thursday, we went to the McNeely uh, Daycare Center. 
uh, infant to age five, and we split up and went to different classrooms, and a little boy hit me in the eye. <laughs> that was a joy. <laughs> no, no, it really wasn't, but you keep going, you know. You keep going. And then we went outside and played outside and in that heat with them kids, and we had a blast, and they had a blast. But uh, Friday, we, we painted, part of our team painted, and the other part, we assembled furniture, and uh, man, oh man, I just, I, I just love it when we work hard, and we believe we're doing everything in record time, and no other team can do it as fast as us. That's how I feel. I mean, that's how these young people were working that hard and fast, and once we got it down, man, we were cruising. And uh, we wanted them to, to know who Mantino is and who Jesus is. I want to turn to Philippians chapter 2 uh, and verses 12 through 15. Philippians 2, 12 through 15. I'm, I'm headed for the end of verse 15, 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in, the, in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, you are, it did not say work for your salvation. That's not what is going on here. These are p saved people, but they need to tend to their salvation. Tend to your walk as a disciple. Like tending to a, a garden. Uh, we need to constantly weed out things, don't we? We need to weed things out of our lives as well. Thirteen. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you'll prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, listen to this, among whom you appear as lights in the world. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's why we do ministry. That's why we uh, will go out and help people because we are lights to our community. Praise God. Now, secondly, today, there is a danger of focusing on lesser lights. We talked about John the Baptist said, I'm not the light, but he who comes after me. I'm not worthy to undo his sandal. Remember that? Because he was talking about the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world when he pointed at Jesus there on the banks of the Jordan River that day. And so uh, lesser lights today could be uh, membership mentality. Membership mentality. Membership has its privileges, but instead of seeing the church as a club, we need to see it as the body of Jesus. It is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ, and we don't need to whittle it down to a club because for some people, that's all the church is. It's a spiritual do-good club, and they enjoy it. They, they enjoy the friends they make there. They feel good about doing service projects. But we are the body of Christ on earth. We are the kingdom. And so let's look at it that way. Let's look at Acts 2.47 and then back to 41. <clears throat> Acts 2, 47. 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, it's not a club. A club, you do certain things to meet the requirements to be part of that club. But you didn't do that for the kingdom. He, he gave that to you. He, he welcomes you, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding you to the kingdom when you got saved. Verse 41, so then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls or 3,000 people. I want you to go over to Colossians real quick. Colossians, you know those tiny books are hard to find. I know that. Go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> It's after 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. They're all tiny books there, but boy, it's worth it. It's worth it. All right, so Colossians chapter 1, 18, 19, and 20. 1, 18, 19, and 20. He, and we're talking about Jesus, he is also 
head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace. Isn't that beautiful? Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Praise his name. Don't disparage the church, my friends. It is the body of Jesus Christ. When you disparage the church, you're disparaging him. How do I know that? Remember when Saul met in the bright light, Jesus on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Jesus is in heaven. What do you mean persecuting you? When you attack the body of Christ on earth, you're attacking Jesus. Do not disparage the church. Do, do not make the body of Christ nothing in the eyes of those that you talk to. Matthew 16, 16, Jesus said, I will build my church. And, and he, what he built, let us not tear down. What he built, let us not put down. Another, number two, another danger, a lesser light or feelings that are produced in a church like ours. We have a good fellowship. Well, you'll see hugging and handshaking and joke telling and laughing and fellowship and Bible study. People care. There's joy. We are strengthening one another. We're encouraging one another. Well, why is that a problem? Well, we're commanded, commanded to do these things. Yeah. Fellowship is fantastic. The security that we have in fellowship, the, the, the bonding, the togetherness, the joy. But I want you to understand this. that the feelings produced in a church family are a byproduct of knowing Jesus Christ. Don't get caught up in that, that you forget to pray to Jesus, that you forget to read your Bible, that you forget to witness for the Lord. You, oh, I don't like to do all those things. I just like the fellowship. Yeah. I, just, I just enjoy the hug. And so be careful that uh, it's Jesus you're serving. It's Jesus you're loving. It's Jesus you're intimate with while you enjoy the byproduct of Jesus, and that's the church. So when you break fellowship uh, with the church, you're out of fellowship with the body of Christ. If we're the body, he's the head. You sever yourself off from the church. Look what you've done to your relationship with Jesus. Remember 1 John 1, 7? If we walk in the light, Jesus, he himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. But, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Why would you tell people that you don't have to go to church? I've heard people say that. You know, if Creighton Beatty started the church, I'd agree with you. You don't have to go. If you started the church, I, yeah, I agree with you. You don't have to go. But Jesus started the church. Why are you telling somebody they don't have to go? I, that doesn't make sense to me. We don't have the authority to say that, and we shouldn't say it. We ought to stop saying it. We need each other. Fellowship produces good feelings. Faith produces good feelings. Forgiveness produces good feelings. Fellowship, faith, and forgiveness are essential, but our Feelings are not the central thing. It's not. The central thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we serve him. There, there, there are brothers and sisters around the world dying for Jesus. Do you think they feel good about that? I mean, is, is it, does it feel good to be whacked in the head with a bat? Oh, I just love getting hit in the head for Jesus. No, they don't. They do it for Jesus because they love the Lord and they know that they got a place when they leave this life. Amen. And so we, we need to see membership differently. The central thing is the Lord. Number three, another lesser light is the preacher. Now, I, I enjoy being loved as a person and as a minister, just, just like you enjoy being loved as a person, as a Christian. Sure we do. Uh, I enjoy being appreciated for my work whether it's public work or it's my private work. But to focus on the preacher is wrong. 
Our focus is on Jesus Christ. Now, uh, th there are people who uh, love their preacher and think that he can do no wrong. I'm, you, you know that's true. It's not true at this church, but <laughs> it's true out there somewhere. And they love him so much, they will bend over backwards for him. And, and by the way, that's a sign of a healthy church. There's no healthy churches out there where they, people hate their preacher. It just isn't it, it, so. It's not healthy to hate people. And so my point is there are people who love the church and they love ministry and they love whatever the preacher asks, whatever the minister asks, they're going to do it. And unknowingly, their love for this and the minister can usurp the place of Jesus. And I promise you it's not about Creighton. And I promise you it's not about you. I've heard people in their church say, it's not my church, it's the Lord's church. And we don't, we don't get that technical, but it's true. It's true. It's not, it's not my church. People say, hey, we're thinking about coming to your church. I don't have a church. But we don't talk like that. That's, that's too, it sounds too legalistic. But it's true. It's Jesus' church. And so do not let the minister usurp the place of Jesus in your life. The, when the preacher makes a mistake, many people, I can't believe he, I can't believe he did that. And they leave. They, learn, they leave the church. Some drift into apostasy. They become unfaithful to Jesus. Why? Because they were following a man instead of following Jesus Christ. Another danger is when people say, it's a bad attitude, but they say, oh, I just love Jesus, but I can't stand the Bible. They won't read the Bible. They're not going to study the Word. Isn't that ridiculous? You, you know that the words for Jesus, uh, the words they use in Scripture in our text, especially in John 1.1, 1, 1, is Jesus is the Word. He's the word. His words were spoken. He got his words from the Father. And you have to be in the Bible. You have to, How are you going to know Jesus? Oh, I just love Jesus with all my heart. You don't even know Jesus if you won't read the word. Because the word, you know, I look at that sunset. Man, that's beautiful. That's God's creation. But I don't, I don't see the word of Jesus in the sunset. You've got to go to the book. You learn who Jesus is by the book. And so you've got to know the book. Our text of John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the Word. word. He's the Word. And if you teach just one word out of that book, you're teaching doctrine. You like the, you like the doctrine of love? It's a doctrine. Today, doctrine's a dirty word. <laughs> I can't believe it. Get me a bar of soap. I can't believe I said the word doctrine. Doctrine's beautiful. The word is beautiful. The te you don't like doctrine? Most translations today won't, won't write doctrine. They write teaching. It's the same thing. It's the teaching of the church. It, it, and so you, you can't teach Jesus without teaching doctrine, and you can't teach doctrine without teaching uh, about Jesus. I want to go to 1 Peter. So that's going to be an easier one to find. You're going to get that after Hebrews and James. And Hebrews is a large book. So you, you can find 1 Peter easy enough. You're going to go to chapter 1, 22 through 25. 22 through 25. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. You like that doctrine? Love one another from the heart? That's doctrine. <sighs> 23, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living, enduring word of God. It's through the word of God we heard about Jesus. It's through the word of God we heard about his love and his grace. Read the word. Read the word. For all, verse 20, 24, for all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of God 
endures forever. The word of God don't fall off. And this is the word which was preached to you. Go to 2 Peter. I bet you can find that one. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Spoke from God. If you can't stand the Bible, that's a reflection on you, not on Jesus. Love the word. Thirdly today, the great love, the body of Christ we're talking about, and Jesus causes us to respond to him. His great love and grace causes us to respond. And so I want to go over to, uh, we're in John 1. Look at verses 14 through 18. 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh. Who is that? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus became flesh. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. And it's both of them. If you only give truth and no grace, that's, that tends to be a little legalistic. If you, if you give all grace and you won't tell them the truth, what have you got on your hands? What have you got on your hands then? It's both, grace. It's like a battery has got to have a positive and a negative to get a charge. And you need grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth. There's that phrase again, grace and truth, were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Wow. This is, this is a good, beautiful text of Scripture. When we accept Christ as Lord, we experience his grace. We experience his hospitality. You've been places where they just threw out the hospitality richly. This is what this is talking about. How God, the Father, how Jesus Christ just throws out the hospitality on us by his grace. Verse 16 says, grace upon grace. That's a cool phrase because it's non-ending. I, I hope that you had a, a grandmother. I hope that she lived a long time. And, but there's nobody's love like grandma. Grandma's love. Because grandma's love just keeps on coming. Jesus' love is grace upon grace upon grace. It just keeps on coming. It's like the Energizer Bunny. So what does grace upon grace mean? Well, grace upon grace is another way of describing an abundance of grace. It's ongoing grace. You see, God deals out grace different than, than we do. We only give grace to those we like. And, and when we think that, well, grace, God's grace coming to us was a one-time deal when we got saved, and after that, we have to earn the grace. And that's not true, but that's how we feel a lot of times. And, and that's why a lot of people do good works. They, they do good works because they want to keep the grace coming. Well, the grace is a gift because we're not perfect. And, and imperfect people need grace. Perfect people don't need any grace because they're perfect. But guess what? We're, none of us are perfect. I've met some people that thought they were. That don't count. It's through Jesus Christ. You know that. I'm not teaching you anything new. People see grace as something that is given freely once, but again, to get grace more, it's based upon performance. And no, it says grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. 
He keeps giving it because we need it. Now, the thing is, we love it that God gives us grace upon grace. We love it. We just don't want to give it to anybody else. Now, they've offended me three times. Ah! You're out. There's no grace in that. Three strikes, and you're, you're out. There's uh, two songs I want to mention, some lyrics, and uh, I love them both. One was Tracy Lawrence. That's his old song, 2007. Uh, the actual title is Find Out Who Your Friends Are. I don't call it that. I can't remember titles too well. Uh, I, I call it the, uh, the Hit the Gas and Get There Fast song. <laughs> I, I can only remember about six words. I'm good on any song for about six words, and I'm done. And uh, this one says, um, when you hear that your friend's in, in, a, in a tough place, you run out, you crank up the car, you hit the gas, you get there fast, never stop to think, what's in it for me? You just go. And uh, there's a lot of groups in the world that, that act like that. But the number one group should be the church. It should be the church. There's a hymn that was written in 1917, so it's over 100 years old. It was written by Frederick Lehman, The Love of God. I love the third verse, but I'll get there in a minute. The first verse says, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. It goes beyond the highest star. It reaches to the lowest hell. The chorus says, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure. The saints and angels song. But that third verse is the one I love. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a tribe, a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though it was stretched from sky to sky. The love of God, the grace upon grace, it just never runs out. I can serve a God like that, can't you? He took all the risk. He forgave us. He empowers us. He walks with us. He equips us. He loves us. He provides for us. He gives us salvation. He gives us a church home. He gives us the promises of heaven. He gives us joy and love and peace. He initiated the love affair with mankind. That's how much he loves us. One of the scriptures the praise team read today was that Romans 5. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of the cross of Calvary, he died for us. Praise his name. God laid out his heart for us to either step on or to cherish. And it's beautiful to be in the presence of people who cherish God's heart. Thank you. Now in closing, back in the 70s in Connecticut, so you can imagine how far up that is, uh, and and they, they've got a rule with the state troopers. At the first snow, they are to put chains on their patrol cars. The first snow. Lady called in to the dispatcher, and she said, there's a state trooper car out here. It's wrecked, and it's, it's flipped over on its top. And, and, she, and the dispatcher asked, is anyone hurt? And she said, I don't know, but he's acting bizarre. He's standing on the bottom of the car and he's trying to put the chains on the tires. <laughs> now you know what that rascal's doing, don't you? He knew it was the company policy. The first snow, you put the chains on your tires and he did not do it. He was busted. But before the other state troopers and the ambulance and everybody was going to get there, he was going to have those chains on them tires. Yeah, because there's a penalty. I don't know what the penalty was, but it was severe enough that he struggled to get those chains on before anybody saw it. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the first time I laid down a motorcycle in the grass. You jump up and look around, and anybody see it? <laughs> see it. Nobody saw it. It didn't happen. 
Oh, my goodness. Our good works sometimes are our attempts to win our way to heaven. And you can't win your way to heaven. It's a gift. We want to work our way to the pearly gates. Jesus died for you. 1 Peter 2, 24, and this is my last words. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, to right living. He died that we'd be done with this world. And it's going to cost you everything you got to be a disciple. <laughs> Not for salvation, that's free. But you got to give it your all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you today for your word. When John wrote down these words of uh, the first chapter, uh, they were, they're pure gold. I ask, Father, your blessings upon uh, this church family, upon those watching by YouTube. People struggle in this world. They don't, they don't have it made. They weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. But praise God, we've got a heavenly Father that loves us. And praise you, Father. I celebrate you that you sent Jesus to this world to die for us. And he did. I think about how we all would have wanted to give up when they started whipping us on the back. Or they pressed down and, and beat with a, a stick those uh, Palestinian thorns upon our head and say enough's enough. But Jesus didn't do that. Thank you, Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen.